Hello, and welcome to the Jake and Gino Show. Today's guest is Doreen Rivers, a Jane of many trades, and she has mastered them all. A PhD in business management, a degree in creative writing, a general contractor license in construction. And to top it off, she's built, grown, and sold many numerous businesses, which is today's theme. How you can build, grow, and then exit a business and enjoy your journey. Welcome to the show, River. Gino, thanks so much. It is so fun to be here. Um, we had a little pre-chat before we got online here, and I, this is just going to be pure fun. I love what you do here. I love the service that you provide for every people, other people, and especially the information that you give them that helps them to better their lives. Well, we're going to be pitching the book today. I got a great book over here, Brain to Bank. My first question for you is, how do you know as an entrepreneur that you've got a good idea worth pursuing? That's a great first question, and um, I'll answer that by telling you sort of what happened to me and how I got to know the answer to that. And it really, it all started with a toothpick. I was eight years old, and my brother and I were walking down the street, and all these kids had these lemonade stands, and they're selling lemonade for a penny a piece, and they're all in competition with each other at the same price, and we're thinking, well, you know, we need to make some money too. But we don't want to do what everyone else is doing. So we took these old-fashioned ice cube trays, the metal ones, and we filled them with Kool-Aid. And we put them in the freezer. And the trick is to remember about halfway through the process to go and stick these toothpicks in. So that at the end of the day, you have these little baby popsicles, which we called cubesicles. And then we sold those for two cents, twice as much as what everything else was going for. And within a week, we had all the lemonade business. So we knew we had a novel idea. And the reason that we knew it was working is because we had all the business and all the money. And so it comes down to knowing your market and knowing who your target audience is and then creating what it is that they will want. Um, you can do this two different ways. You can create a product that you think is so awesome and then at the end of the day, you can go and try and find an audience and find your target market and find, try and find someone to buy it. Or you can find what the audience wants and then you can create that and your, your built-in platform is already there and you just simply insert it and start selling. And that, that's what we did. And I recommend that method because it works. Mm -hmm. River, uh, Writing a book is a labor of love. I know it's painful. There's usually not a lot of money to be made. Why did you write this book and who did you write it for? It, it is a labor of love, but it's also a labor of insanity. Um, if, you've ever, <laughs> it if, is. if you've ever written a book, uh, writing the book is the easy part. The, the hard part is in the rewrites. And you keep looking at it and fine tuning it and making it better and sending it to editors. They send it back and you go, gosh, I didn't know there were 931 mistakes in here. So you have to go back and fix all that. And now you're on draft number 39 and you're so sick of looking at it. But excellence is in the details and it's in that process. And running a business is, is just like that. Having an idea is the beginning of what it is that you have decided to do for the next several years. And then coming up with the systems and processes and fine tuning that so that it runs as a profitable business is the only way really to sustain whatever it is you're trying to do. If you're creating a product or you're creating a service for others, you can invent a, a little robot that is so awesome and it runs across your desk and it grabs a pencil and it brings it back to you and you're just going, oh my gosh, my invention works. And you can't wait to invent the robot. But at, at the end of all of that, what you have is a robot. You don't have a business. So the book is about how to create the infrastructure and the core of the business, which is going to be the thing that helps you to sell what you've created and then be profitable at the same time. And I spent 30 years helping companies start their businesses. They would call me and say, hey, we got this great idea for a healthcare company. Uh, can you come and get it up and running? And I would go and, and I've come in as early as even naming the companies. 
and creating the operations part of it and the systems and the processes and the product development and the global expansions and the sales teams and HR and everything that goes into here's your business. And after a year and a half or two, I hand it to them and I say, don't kill the baby. And then I go and run, start another company. So this is 30 years of experience of really, frankly, what most people do wrong and should have done in the first place in order to really be successful and, and to be able to sell it properly or pass it down to your kids or liquidate it or however you're going to just, you know, leave the business. Cause at some point you're going to leave the business or it's going to leave you. So, so why mm -hmm. don't you define how that's going to look? And so I talk about that in the book, uh, at the same time. At Jake and Gina, we say we create multifamily entrepreneurs. And we were talking before we hit the record button that investing in real estate is like building a business. It's scalable. It's an amazing business. It's an asset. As you started helping people build businesses, can you give us a sense of what big mistakes people make when they start it? I mean, let's say, Gino, I'm really excited. I want to get into multifamily. I want to start buying real estate. What are some of the mistakes you see entrepreneurs or business owners starting their business? Well, that, that's a great example because it, it is a business. If you think you're just going to go and have a hobby and start buying properties, uh, you're probably not going to be successful. You have to create the business infrastructure around that. So the first thing people usually do wrong is they would go out and just start buying properties. It's like, create your business. What kind of business is this? Are you going to create uh, an LLC? Is it going to be a partnership? Uh, is it a sole proprietorship? And, and the, in the book, there are uh, a whole chart that shows you the different entities. And you can look at that and you're going to think, I think this is the best one. And then I say, okay, great. Now go talk to your attorney and CPA and make sure you're right about that. And then set it up properly and, and get some background on financials, set up QuickBooks or something. If you don't know your numbers and you don't know where your money is, you don't really know what's going on with your business. And so you have to do that part properly. You need to figure out who's your audience. And in the case of real estate, you have to figure out, well, am I buying multifamily units? Am I buying single units that I'm going to rent? Uh, am I buying condos in a foreign country? Really, what am I going to buy here? Because you're not buying everything. You're going to have a certain kind of real estate you're interested in. What is it? Okay, now that you have that, what are your parameters? What are you buying? How are you, are you going to turn it and flip it? Are you going to keep it and rent it? You need to know all of those things or you end up buying all the wrong things and having a little of everything. And then you, you haven't defined anything. So, so you need to know, and you need to do your homework on what is my business all about? And when you do a business plan, it forces you to think about everything I've just mentioned. I worked with a company recently who ran a DBA, a doing business as, in a company that had been around for five decades. And they decided to start a new company within the company. And then they decided to sell this little company. And all their finances were commingled with the parent company. Uh -huh. They didn't have a business plan. Uh, they couldn't spin that out and, and sell it in the mergers and acquisitions, which is what they were trying to do because it meant they were selling the whole thing and they weren't selling the whole thing. So we had to create a business plan. We had to take all their financials out. We had to create a new business entity so that it stood on its own and they weren't selling the core company. And I mean, it was a nightmare and it took us six months to sort it all out. And it was a lot of time and a lot of money. And what if they had just done that in the beginning? So, you know, the book talks about that. Do this first, then go have fun with whatever it is. Go buy your real estate, go create your robot, go whatever it is you're creating after you figure out the business part of it and do it properly. Mm -hmm. I want to share a few things. As, as you've been speaking, uh, I see a lot of our students when they join, they make all the mistakes that you've said. The first thing is most people, when they start businesses, they want to scale up. They outgrow their infrastructure. So River's telling you don't outgrow your infrastructure. That's the first thing. The second thing is your exit strategy. When you're buying real estate, what is the exit? You know, Stephen Covey talks about what is the end in mind? What are you doing with this specific piece of real estate? Are you going to hold on to it for the next 20 years? Are you going to fix it and flip it? 
That's really important. And we talk about the buy right, the manage right, and the finance right. You're not going out there and just, hey, what's a great deal? Well, a great deal for Jake and Gino is probably not a great deal for, for River. So you have to understand the buy and the manage and the finance portion of buying real estate and understanding what your criteria is. That's why it falls into a business. And as I think all of our real estate listeners are listening to this, they're going, oh, wow, I got into real estate just to buy a couple of deals and to cash a little bit, but you're missing the bigger picture. The bigger picture is you're building a scalable business where you're adding units on and adding units on. And one day you can either sell the entire thing to a private equity firm if you'd like, or you can gift it and give it to the next generation. So thinking about these things early on and not just going out there and buying a deal here and buying a deal there is where we see a lot of uh, a lot of investors making mistakes early on. Would you like to add to that? Because I think there's so many similarities as we're speaking about entrepreneurs as investors and entrepreneurs as business owners. We were spot on about all of that. And, and the bottom line of what you've just said is this, it's really fun to go out and look for the real estate and buy it, but you haven't created a business in which you can actually move that <laughs> yes. real estate to the level that you want to move it. So do that first and then go have fun. People want to jump right into the fun part, but it costs them time and money if they haven't set it up properly. So just do it right in the beginning and then you're going to be successful. You're going to make more money. You're going to have more clarity on what it is that you're buying instead of buying anything that hits your hot button and then realize, oh, that wasn't really a great investment. Mm -hmm. You know, early on, it seemed as if you had a, a ch challenging time uh, getting into business and you could have made tons of excuses. I've got kids at home. I don't have time. I don't have the money. What made you not quit? Because most people in your shoes would have said, I'm the victim here. I, I'm not going to take any, any chances. I, I'm just going to stay home and maybe collect some welfare, or I'm just going to get a job and just take it nice and slow. Meanwhile, you had five children under the age of seven. You're out there trying to open the business, trying to succeed. What what propelled you to take those massive risks and not to, what we say, to be, be a responsibility junkie, to take, that, to take it to the next level and say, I'm not going to play the victim card here? Well, the word victim is the operative word here, and you can choose to be one or choose not to be one, and it's, it starts right there. And you, you can blame and you can complain and you can explain about everything that's going on, or you can just get after it and fix it. And I learned that early in the game. My, my father taught me that, uh, and he never said a, a thing. He just showed me that this is how you do it. And uh, there, I have an older brother and there's six girls in our family. And we all picked up on the fact that you just figure it out. If you want it, you have to go get it. No one's going to hand it to you. And if they hand it to you, you're going to lose it anyway because you didn't earn it. So go get it mm -hmm. and figure out how you're going to do it. And you you set your goal and then nothing stops you. Obviously, there are problems that come along the way every time. And you just go, okay, here's a problem. And a problem is disguised as an opportunity. What's the opportunity here? How do I fix it? Because I'm not stopping and I'm not going to quit i'm going to reach my goal and you keep the end in mind and you take one step at a time and you solve the problems as they come and you keep going until you get there yeah personal mm -hmm. goals are the same way a marriage is that way personal relationships are that way business is that way an adventure is that way you decide you're going to go climb a great big mountain great what are you going to do to get ready for it don't quit until you get to the top it's all the same method you get your goal, you decide how you're going to get there, and then you take the steps to get there. In the book, it talks about you, you, you think it and you decide what it is you want, then you organize it and, and, and get your game plan, and then, and then you do it. It's the action steps, and it's over and over and over those three steps, and you don't quit till you get there. Let me ask you, this might be a challenging question, but... People have a, a tough time of figuring out what their why is. You know, for me, when I was in the restaurant business, I know I made a mistake early on. I didn't inherit it from my family. It was a family business. And it seems as if we created the business to support our lifestyle, to support the family. And I had to run the business because it was providing for my family where that was the wrong mindset. 
I really, I should have been providing for my customers, although we were, but I didn't think of it from that perspective, trying to provide as much value for them. And then I got into real estate and I found out the impact that I could have with starting the Jake and June education. So that's where I, I, I've derived my why from to create impact. Have you found it challenging for yourself or for a lot of your clients to figure out what their why is? Why are they doing something? They're like, oh, I, I'm passionate about working out. So let me start a, a gym. I mean, that's to me can be dangerous. Uh, have, how do you help people figure out what their why is or even why they should be starting a business? Chapter one talks about that. And the first thing you do need to know is, is why are you doing this? So for example, when I had all my five kids at home and there was no money coming in, uh, what was my why? And I could say, well, you know, we, we, we need money. Well, then you go down another level. Why do you need money? Well, because my husband was in a construction accident and he hurt his back and he can't work. So why do you need to be the one to earn the money? Well, because there's no one else and his parents are old and, and, and my parents don't have the means to help. So I have to do it. Well, why do you have to do it? Because my kids need, need shoes and they need clothes for school. Well, why do they need that? They need it because all their friends have these new Nikes and, and they don't have them and it's making them feel left out. And it's, it's, affecting their self-esteem. Well, five levels down, now you realize I'm doing this because I want to help my kids' self-esteem and make them feel confident when they go to school. That's your real answer. It's not, I need money. Mm -hmm. So you have to dig down. But what happens is once you've done that process, when these problems and these challenges occur, which inevitably they will, you just cling to that and you say, I'm doing this because I love my kids so much. I want them to feel good about who they are. And that gets you through whatever it is that just showed up. Mm -hmm. Has your why changed as you've gotten older and gotten into business? Because now it's not about the kids' clothes. It's not about self-esteem anymore. I, I mean, mine, obviously, for myself, is, has evolved tremendously from when I first started buying multifamily till now. Has yours you know, it has. And, and I think part of that, Gino, is that, you know, we reach a level of self-sustainability and it's no longer about being on Maslow's level one, where you're worried about shelter and, and food and, and, and safety. You're rising above that and you're worried about, uh, or not worried really, maybe more uh, your, your why changes and your passion changes and your reason changes. And it becomes, I really would like to help people understand what I've just spent 30 years learning. Now, number one, they shouldn't have to make all those mistakes because I made most of them for them. So if they can mm -hmm. learn from that, great. Uh, Oliver, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, you know, you can't learn all the mistakes yourself. So learn from others. And uh, there's a huge chapter uh, section in each chapter of the book called Another series in the, uh, in the, another episode in the drama series of I didn't see it coming. And it's all the mistakes that entrepreneurs made while they were getting their businesses up and running. So read those. Don't do that. Do this. And, and so the life change, the life, uh, the reasons for moving forward and wanting to help others is because I've done all that and I would love to see you do it better than I did it. So here are the mistakes I've learned and here's what you can do to avoid all of that and move forward much quicker. You, you can do a, a bad game of mother may I, which is take one step forward and two steps backward by making all the mistakes yourself, or you can keep moving forward because here's a roadmap that shows you how to do it. And I love to be able to have people call me or email me and say, I read your book. I started my business. Uh, I can't tell you how much help it was for me because I didn't make those mistakes. I learned not to make them. I learned what to do. And that is rewarding. And I guess in some way, that's a selfish thing for me to want to feel good about helping other yes. people. But at, at the end of all of that, it is what can I do to help other people? Because I'm okay where I am now. What can I do to help lots of other people at this point. Mm -hmm. As people are scaling their businesses, it's really challenging to scale a business, especially if you've never done it before. What are some of the mistakes you see people doing when they're scaling businesses? 
I think it all comes down to the initial systems and processes that you set up. And if you have uh, mm -hmm. kinks in that, in, in what you've set up in the original business to think that you're going to, let's say, add another store or franchise it or try to duplicate that in another location. If you have inherent problems with original store, why would you want to duplicate those problems? <clears throat> so really, you've got to nail that in the beginning and make sure all that's working properly before you decide to duplicate that. And that's probably the, the biggest issue is what have you set up? Is it done properly? Is it working great? What can you do to make it better before you do it again somewhere else? And people move too fast thinking two stores is better than one. And a lot of times what you find out is that your second store makes half as much as the first one and takes twice as much manpower to keep it up and running. So it really isn't profitable. And why did you do this too soon? Mm -hmm. Do you think river that most people, when they start a business, they think they want to scale and they're saying to themselves, yeah, I want my next business, but I'm, 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 a, I'm the guy I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And I'm a gets burned out and they don't even know how to systematize it. And, and they're making all these excuses. Shouldn't they think beforehand, well, should I have one business or multiple businesses? Isn't that part of the exit strategy? Isn't that a big mistake that most people make? It's the same thing in multifamily. It's okay if you're going to buy a few little properties, but if you want to scale up to six or seven or 800 units or 1200 units, you're going to need to start hiring employees. You're going to need to start hiring infrastructure. Software is different. Uh, accounting is different. Don't you think people make, make that mistake as well? Absolutely, they do. And it's the old adage that more is better and maybe it is and maybe it's not. If you kept a, a, a single business mm -hmm. and you really became the big fish in the small pond, that's better than yes. being a small, a small fish in a great big pond with all that competition. And that's one of the first things to think mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the hardest things in business for us is, is the sales and marketing aspect of it. I think, People underestimate and the importance of putting a lot of effort into marketing. Do you have any tips or any strategies on marketing to, to, to grow the business? Because I think sales and marketing are too distinct. I think they need to work together, but I think they're two distinct, uh, uh, I guess, branches of, of business. You have operations, you have systems, but then you have sales and marketing. Any tips on, on marketing for the business? Yeah, a, a couple things. Uh, they say there are two things you should never fully give to someone else to do. You should keep your hands on it. One is one is the finances. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, is marketing. You're, you're branding and who you are, and especially on the startup, who you're coming out of the gate as saying you are is important. And you want to keep tabs on that. And, and you're right. Sales is one thing. And people who help you in sales, they're a, they're a different personality than people who are in marketing. Sales are outgoing and they know how to influence people and, and they know how to put forth uh, not just features, but benefits and talk about how this is going to help you as a person or a company or whatever. Marketing is different. Marketing is saying this, the same thing, but it's not, it, it's more of a subliminal persuasion and it's about visuals and it's about one liners and it's way different than a salesperson that has five to 30 minutes to teach you about something as opposed to a, a single image that's going to show up on a social media post that's supposed to tell you everything in the three seconds that you're reading, whatever it is that tagline is. It's completely different. They mm -hmm. do need to work together, but marketing is, is a creative endeavor. And sales is more of a relationship built endeavor. And they you're coming at it a completely different mindset on who it is that's doing what. Mm -hmm. Before we go to short answers, I wanted to ask you about branding. Since you've been doing this for 30 years, I've seen that over the third, last 30, 40, 50 years since I've, since I've been born, I was born in the 70s, that branding has completely changed. Whereas you would think Coca-Cola was a brand. And now it appears like anybody every single one of us has our own individual unique brands. Do you talk about branding in the book at all? And how do you help your clients with, with them branding themselves? 
I do talk about that. And there's a whole section on marketing and branding in the book. And one of the first things is to realize that first and foremost, your product isn't your brand. You're your brand. What have you created? What's the culture? Uh, what are the values of your company? That's the brand. And it's not necessarily a logo or the product, a picture of the product. It's what you stand for. And it's why are you trying to sell me this or offer this to me? That's the brand. What's behind that? Who are you and what do you stand for? So you need to craft that very carefully and you need to know yourself. What are my values? What am I standing for? What, what, what are the things my company is going to do? And what are the things my company will refuse to do? And you need to know that from the beginning because everything else, all the marketing and all the branding that you're going to do stems off of this is what we do and this is what we don't do. And that has to be well-defined. Well, I, I've said this multiple times on, on my, our shows is my biggest mistake is why I had only one restaurant for 20 years is I didn't have the core values. We didn't have the culture in that small little business. But I think Jake and I over the last several years have been able to cultivate the core values of our company, the, the culture and the mission statement, our big, hairy, audacious goal. Do you see that as one of the big mistakes that most entrepreneurs make when they start a business? They don't even, it's not even on our radar. No one's ever taught us this stuff. And we just think of brand as, hey, you got a nice little flashy logo, got a cute little website, but no one talks to us about culture or core values. The, the, they don't. And it's really a fairly new, I won't say it's a new concept as much as it, it's a new awareness of what companies stand for. Yes. And, um, you know, there's, mm. there's a social awareness that has now creeped into what a company is all about and what 50, 5013C are you connected to and where are you giving back? And all these things have become important to be able to put forth as to this is what our company does, this is what we stand for, this is who we're helping with the success that we've had. All, all that's pretty new. It, it really wasn't something we thought about, but now you need to think about it. And some of the newer generations coming up who are thinking of starting a business, it matters to them what you stand for and it matters to them who you're giving back to because that's important to them. And it wasn't one of the first questions that people asked 20 or 30 years ago, but they're asking it now. So you need to ask yourself the same questions. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Jake and Gino's Multifamily Mastery 6 is coming to the Gaylord Palms in Orlando, Florida this October 14th and 15th. Join Jake and Gino as they welcome special guests like Chris Voss, Luke Wren, David Green, and many more. Discover Jake and Gino's three-step framework for real estate success, enabling students to accumulate $4 billion in assets. MM6 is the multifamily event of 2023 that you do not want to miss. Go to jakeandgino.com forward slash MM6 to reserve your tickets today. And we're back. You know, River, I want to ask you this question because you've been doing this for, you said, over 30 years. Do you think it's easier to start a business today or 30, 40 years ago? And why? I think it's much easier. I think you can spend uh, the morning going on the internet, go to, go to GoDaddy, figure out what your name is of your company, get your domain name in the next 15 minutes, go to the state online and register your company as an LLC, which will actually make your paper, your organizational papers for you and submit that and pay your 60 bucks. And in 10 days you have your company ready and you go and get your license. And meanwhile, you've hired someone to put together your website, which is done in 14 days you're up and running and the logistics of how to do the groundwork on that is uh, so much easier now than it ever used to be. You used to have to go down to the state and fill out the papers and, and hope that no one else has your name and find out 30 days later, someone has that name. Let's choose something else. And it's all done at your fingertips on the internet. You can have it done in half a day, but that doesn't mean you have a business. It means that you have a name, and a website. What's your business? Who mm -hmm. are you selling to? Who? What's, what, what's the demographics of your target audience? 
those are things you have to think about and figure out. You do your homework. The internet helps you with who's your competition. What things are the competition not doing that you can do that customers in their reviews are saying, gosh, this is a great product, but I wish it did this. Read all that. Go find out what it is that people wish they had that they don't have. Go create that. The internet helps you do that as well. But you can sit in your pajamas, in your office, in your kitchen desk or whatever, and can get it all figured out in a matter of days. And if that hits your hot button and your passion's behind that, you're going, this is awesome. I've always wanted to do this, and now I see the gap in what it is that people need. I'm going to go do that. You're you're up and running. It's so much easier now. Mm-hmm. There's also more competition mm-hmm. for exactly the same reasons. I, you know, I, I'll double that sentiment. And I'll even say when I started investing in real estate, say over 20 years ago, there was no internet. There was no Google Maps. There was no census data. There was no median income data. There was really no loop net. It was really a lot harder. You actually had to get into a plane, fly into a market, walk around the market, meet brokers. Now you can do all of your research from the comfort of your home. You can actually do Zoom calls with brokers. You have listings. You have email. You have te- you have so much easier to do it now. And with that, like you said, it brings competition. But there's no excuse for somebody to say, I mean, you can pick up this phone. You've got a computer for less than a thousand bucks that's more powerful than what River and I had years ago, driving around with a little beeper. I, it just and you could throw up a video on YouTube right now and put an Instagram short in thirty seconds. So that. Is not the that's not what's holding people back from creating a successful business. I think the book really discusses the framework on how to build a business. I think first of all, people have to figure out the why. Why are we doing this? And then from the why, I like that, figuring out the target market, working with that as well, figuring out what your product, what your service you're going to deliver, and then start implementing the strength, the framework, the structures within it. Uh, you're talking about the systems, and it may seem a little daunting, but your first one may not work out. My first investment didn't work out. But like River said, it don't let that first one hold you back. You learn from that very first one. And I think this is now, we didn't have this River years ago ourselves. We didn't have consultants and we didn't have mentorship programs and we didn't have trainings 20, 30 years ago. We were sort of winging it ourselves. We didn't have education like, like there is now at your fingertips. We actually hired people to help us scale out. Isn't that the difference as well? And nowadays, there's so much information. You just need to cultivate the information that's right for you. Wouldn't you agree with that as well? 100%. I mean, just go on YouTube for two or three hours and learn whatever it is you need to know. It's it's all there. It's a video. Mm-hmm. Turn it on. It's free. You learn from it. Take your notes and go, okay, here's my action steps from what I just learned. The, the Brain to Bank book walks you through step by step every chapter. At the end of every chapter, it's like, okay, now you've learned this. Here are the questions you need to ask yourself to move forward to the next step. What's the best entity for me? What am I selling? What's my chart? Whatever chapter that is, there are pages in there that say, okay, now let's work on your game plan, your roadmap. And then you write in there Mm -hmm. your answers that have to do with your product and your service. And it's not just a, a bunch of here's information. It's here's the information. And then it's What are you going to do with what you just learned? And the action steps are there. If you do that Mm -hmm. and you go from A to Z, your business is done. And it's just one step at a time. Just take each one of them. Don't buy into any kind of fear that creeps up, which is, I don't think I can do this. What if I lose my money? What if my wife hates it? What if she doesn't want me to do it? What will my kids say? whatever it is, blow it off because you've had this idea for a long time. You still have it. That means you need to do something with it. Here's how to do that. Mm -hmm. I love that. The book by book by I forgot what the author's name is. Stephen Pressfield. I can't believe I can't believe Stephen forgot his name. He wrote the book Resistance, the War of Art, actually, and, and the really 
topic in there, the, t- the whole theme is resistance. If you're, if you have that resistance that Rivers t- is talking about right now, where uh, I shouldn't do this, it's, it's, it's too risky. My wife might not like it. I may lose money and you keep having that resistance. That means you need to go towards that. That's the idea. If it doesn't really mean that much to you, then it's really not that important. So I, I want to thank you for bringing that up. because That's so important. I'm supposed to be asking these short answer questions. Jake's supposed to be taking over here. He's not here. So he typically asks the guests, what's your favorite uh, habit for success? Uh, to me, it seems like you've got a lot of energy. You take care of yourself exercise wise. But what would you say is something you do every day or on a weekly basis that really propels you to continue to succeed in life? On, on Sunday night, I map out my whole entire week. And then every night before uh-huh. I go to bed, I make a detailed list of what's coming up the next day. So if there are interviews, there's a certain time there. And then what's going to be in between those times where I am obligated to do something else? What am I going to do to move the boat forward? If every stroke you take doesn't move the boat, the boat forward, you shouldn't be rowing that boat. What are those steps? And I do it every night. So the next day when I get up, I'm not thinking about it. I know what that first step is and I'm off and running. And Jake was here. He would say amen because he's got his little cardstock. He spends like two hours every Sunday mapping out his whole week. I mean, it's like a, he's like a little child. He's got a black marker and he's scribbling. I mean, it's just really – and every hour he's got something going on. And if he doesn't have it on, it goes on to the next day or it just goes on to the weekend and he'll he'll get it done. And people may say to themselves, ah, that's just too much work for me. I, I don't want to do that. But once you become disciplined, it's not any work. You're on autopilot. You don't have to think. You're actually doing things that you're you're that you're that you're you're planned on, and you're not surfing the internet. You're not scrolling Instagram or Facebook because you've got something to do that part of the day. So that is that is what a lot of successful entrepreneurs do. Now, books. You've written a book. What is uh, one or two books that you'd recommend to the listeners um, that you that you recommend? I, I love the book uh, Lean Startup because a lot of people are worried about the money and what it costs to start your own business. So read Lean Startup. It's a fabulous book on how to do it. And another part of that is uh, I'm just spinning out another very small book in the next couple of weeks. It's called Working Together Alone. It's called The Beauty uh, and Freedom of Outsourcing. And it's about how to hire virtual assistants and outsource things that you don't want to or cannot do. You're going to outsource your financials because it's not your deal and it takes you forever to do it. So, so outsource it. It's editing a video that you want to put together. It's someone writing copy for some emails that you need to send, whatever it is that you're stop that is stopping you from moving forward means that you should find the person to do that for you. Uh, it's uh, Dan Sullivan's book, Who Not How. You don't need to figure out how to do everything. Yes. You need to figure out who is going to help you do it. And then you become the general contractor. And these are all your subcontractors. Now you have the best of the best. And you're managing that instead of doing all of it. And that's one of the most important things, especially for solopreneurs, people who are working on their own. You can build a global company by outsourcing all these different things and working with people all over the world. And here's how you do it. And that's a critical thing to learn because you can't do it all and there's not enough time. And frankly, you don't know how to do it all. And should you take time learning that? The answer is no. Hire someone else that already knows how to do it. There's another reason why business is much easier than it was 30 years ago. There was no such thing as a virtual assistant 30 years ago. The virtual assistant would have been my wife or my kids. That would have been the virtual assistant. There's no one helping me out. And it's just amazing for 10 bucks or 15 bucks an hour, what somebody can, what somebody can do for you as far as quality work. So I, that's, I'm looking forward to reading that book because that's, that's going to help a lot of people out because you, you don't have to focus on all that. You can actually take some of that out of the business and, and let somebody do it. That's more qualified than you for a fraction of what you're worth. That's awesome. That is great. Where can the listeners get a hold of you? Where can they find, where where can they find out more about you? Check out the website, braintobank.com. It talks about the book. It gives you free tools and free resources beyond what the book is offering. Tons of of things that will help you get up and running, uh, create a business, uh, a better business, be more successful. It's all free right there. 
any information on other books and things will be there. But that's the best place to start, braintobank.com. And I would just challenge everyone to go pick up the book and read it because Rivers had an amazing life. She's got five children, 20 grandkids, built multiple businesses, scaled mountains, helping other people with their businesses. It's really been, to me, a remarkable life starting from, you know, challenging times and not letting letting that hold her back. We, a lot of us would say, this is just too hard for me. I don't know, but she actually drilled down to her why. And as you're listening to the show and you're just, you know, hearing the recap, drill down deep, spend a couple minutes with yourself, let your emotions go wild for a minute and figure out why you're doing something because it's not where we always use time and money as an excuse. And those are the two excuses that are rarely ever holding you back. It's never really time and it's never really money. If it's really that important to you, spend the time to figure out what your why is. Go to braindbank.com, buy the book. And I just want to thank River for being a great guest today. I appreciate the time today. Thank you.